buprenorphine has um, a little bit of an advantage over some of the pure opioids as we don't develop tolerance to it. So as with morphine, you can quickly develop tolerance to morphine. So you're going to need higher and higher doses to get the same amount of pain control. With buprenorphine, it almost has some type of a hypoalgesic effect. So it's winding down those receptors that may be stimulating the pain going to our brain. So that's one of the advantages of it. We're seeing a lot more of it with, we can use it for pain, and it's also a great agent for medication-assisted therapy for addiction management um, versus methadone. There's a lot less side effects. There's a lot less drug interactions with the medication. So I think that there's an advantage when, for people that are using um, substances inappropriately also. I also think, I mean, for pain, it's um, it has a high affinity for receptors, so it binds strongly. Um, it's, it does, has a ceiling effect, so it, you know, it, it kind of, plateaus out as opposed to the other agents where you have an increased risk of respiratory depression as you go up and up on the drug. So it has a lower risk of respiratory depression, which is nice as well. Um, and then as far as for medication assistant th assisted therapy, it's um, really great because of that high affinity and that long half-life, it hangs on for a while. So the cravings and all of that, um, all the symptoms associated with trying to stay off of you know the drug of abuse, um, it helps reduce those symptoms and it helps that for a long period of time. So once a day is sufficient and it doesn't come necessarily as much with the stigma that methadone comes with. So patients may be more willing to take the therapy. So there's different types of alternatives that we can do and interventions that we could do in someone who's on buprenorphine. One thing you have to know though is what dose are they using? What prop uh, preparation are they using because the patients that are on the higher doses for medication assisted therapy will require more opioid versus someone who may be only on a buprenorphine patch that isn't as strong they may be able to get away with the uh, more of the lower doses of opioids but you have to know in general that these patients are going to need higher doses of opioids to get over the um, the uh, partial affinity of the buprenorphine. So I think that that's one thing that we can do. So there's different modalities. We can actually, one thing that has only been reported in case reports, but one of my practitioners at my institution does, is what they'll do is they'll take the patient's dose, they'll maybe increase it a little bit for the post-op pain that you're going to have and divide it three or, two, three or four times a day. And with that, then using as needed, lower doses buprenorphine for the pain that may come from the surgery or the acute pain situation. So that's one way you can handle it. Another way is you can stop the buprenorphine. If you know you're having an elective surgery in two weeks, you can stop that buprenorphine. You can either use short-acting or long-acting opioids depending on what you're using the buprenorphine for and then use regular opioids post-op before you reinstitute your buprenorphine therapy post-op. That might not work very well if it's emergent, right? So if it's an emergent surgery, you may need to stop the buprenorphine right away and then monitor that patient because as that buprenorphine comes out of your system, you're going to need less opioids. So you run that risk of overdose. What also is not done as much, but we are seeing some studies done on this, is continuing the buprenorphine and then using um, a higher affinity opioid, something like fentanyl, on a patient control analgesia in order to control that pain. And that's usually effective because the buprenorphine does not occupy all of the receptors, so there are other receptors that can be hit by a higher affinity drug, uh, like fentanyl, that's also very lipophilic. So there's some benefits to, to doing that, um, and that to me sometimes can be safer because if you don't know that the buprenorphine is gonna take three days to get out of someone's system, you're not you're dosing and dosing and dosing it on day three, you're not aware that you actually may need to pull back. So I think it depends on kind of where you're at, but I think the most important thing is having kind of almost a standardized approach, if you can, so that people know what to monitor for, know what that we're, we're doing, and if someone's coming in, you have this plan and if, with it, and they're still on buprenorphine, and if, and if we stop it, this is our plan, you know, so that we have a, a plan in mind because it is not as familiar to a lot of people um, in management. I work in an inpatient hospital setting, and you don't know who's covering on the Saturday when that person comes in. So to have some tips and some guidelines to help people to know if they're on buprenorphine, this is kind of what to expect, I think is really critical, especially in this time of kind of like the ramping up of using buprenorphine for both medication-assisted therapy and for pain.